Recording in progress. Okay, Doug, you can do the same thing. Switch. Meeting is being recorded. Got it. I want to make sure that my recording, pause recording and stop recording are there. Otherwise, it wouldn't be. Okay, so I want to welcome everyone to the January 2024 meeting of the 1904 World's Fair Society. Uh, hopefully, Doug, you can see me because I can't see myself. I'll get to that in a second or two. You're there. There we go. Okay, so now people here can uh, see me, see Doug in the back of the room. Um, if you mute yourself and unmute yourself, Doug, that might uh, switch you to me. I'm not sure. Okay, I saw your mouth move, but uh, I just heard you're in the room. Uh, Denny, can you still see my camera? Okay, he's nodding. You're the one of the few little people I can see right now. So we'll go with that for now, and we'll switch to PowerPoint in a couple minutes. Welcome to the meeting. I'm Mike Truax. It's the 120th anniversary of the 1904 World's Fair and our 38th anniversary of the Society. Today, our program will be a new presentation presented by Michael Lloyd. You'll recall that in 2022, he gave us a presentation about Charles Daniels in a book he wrote, who was a surprise gold medal winner at the U.S. for the U.S. in the Olympics. And there's a picture of his book, The Waterman, uh, the story of Charles Daniels and in his un unlikely fight to capture Olympic gold. And we have a few attendance prizes tonight. We'll be drawing six names, and you'll get a chance to choose among nine gifts. We have three sets of gift cards, of which one is uh, this view in my shirt right here of the Ferris wheel and the miniature railroad, a nice Christmas gift that I received and unique as far as I know. We also have a Wichita girl uh, came to the fair and that's a journal that a, a young lady wrote when she came to the fair for her cousin's wedding for about a week and she ended up staying two months. <laughs> And we also have our tote bags, uh, three of our tote bags for you to choose from, a drawstring bag that you can uh, put all your World's Fair uh, not real valuables in because you don't want to break any. Mm -hmm. So be sure and sign up for the uh, attendance prizes in the back of the room and the people that are at home comfortable watching on Zoom. And if you didn't come, you can't get an attendance prize. Mm -hmm. Darn. Okay, first I want to ask if there are either any first time new members here or non members, please raise your hand. Okay, I see about two hands that went up uh, or people that are, you know, really new here, et cetera. Could I ask the guy down kind of the middle aisle to stand up and speak loud so the microphone might pick you up a little bit and we'll take some pictures of you and just tell us how you found out about us and what you're interested in the very yeah. <laughs> Send those pictures to the authorities. Oh. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. My name is Carter. I'm a new member of the fair. I joined uh, over the summer, actually, but I'm in school up in Rochester, New York. So this is the first meeting that I've actually been able to attend. Um, and I leave actually in a few days. So this is the last thing I'm going to attend until <laughs> next summer. <But laughs> well, that's fine. Hopefully, I'll be on some of the Zooms over the next few months and be able to. Do you have a family interest in the fair or you just found out about um, it? No, a few years ago, I found a recording of an exhibit from the 39 New York Fair uh, out of St. Louis. So I discovered the, the St. Louis Fair and did nothing but read about it for, for a little while during COVID. Kind of fell in love with it. So realized there was a society, of course, I had to join and see this. Oh, I'm so glad you joined, and uh, thanks for the information. Check us out, uh, our web store that's online. You can uh, you know, get some of the videos or books and other things from the Society. And I saw, I think, one other hand go up over here. Oh, in the back of the room. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Stephen. Just came across the Society about a month ago. Okay. Joined about a week ago, and then two days after that, I found out that a member of my family from Illinois is at the fair. Oh, oh. Yeah, cool. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> Appreciate you coming. And uh, uh, Doug, you, Doug, you'll be taking a head count for uh, me and uh, Jana, I assume. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, for the Zoom attendees, Doug will be watching the chat room for any questions. So Zoom attendees can ask questions by entering them and typing them into the chat area, which you can see by in the lower right, maybe clicking the three dots and there's a chat ab uh, ability in Zoom. And he'll keep an eye on that. Uh, some regular business. Uh, be sure and visit the Society website regularly. The upgraded website is online. And as I mentioned, uh, it has a Society web store for merchandise and Society goods, a calendar about our upcoming meetings, which I'll cover later on. And uh, other neat items on the website include uh, not only this diary, there's also a 100-page journal written by a young lady that went to the fair and a novel written by our editor, Jana Meehan, about a uh, romance at the fair and in St. Louis. So those are all available there. Uh, speaking of, uh, uh, you can also go to Facebook or on the uh, website, you can see pictures of our past meeting. And on our Facebook page, we have 6,000 members. There's always postings about the World's Fair and events and memorabilia, and sometimes even some stumpers that we have to really go research and get into. Yes, sir. Mike, uh, if you would click on your picture and hit pin, hit the pin button, click on the picture and hit pin. You should be able to pin it so we see you and not necessarily. There it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know you could pin yourself to the uh, Thank you. main picture. Thank you, Art. Um, so check out our Facebook group, and we also are on Instagram, and Holly finds some pictures here and there about the fair that are just uh, really unusual, kind of like this uh, stereo view here. Um, I'm going to briefly go down our officers, and if you're here, just stand up, raise your hand, and if you have anything that uh, you want to tell people about, uh, one of our board members, the Director of Concessions and Admissions, Nan Bortreid, could not be here tonight. She had a conflict meeting with uh, one of her neighborhood hood things that are going on tonight. Uh, Director of Exploitation, Holly Childress. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'd like them all to stand up so that new members or guests, if you want to ask questions, the board members are the one to ask. Uh, we have a couple of handouts in the room. Can you hear me okay in the back? Okay. Uh, we also have a couple of handouts that you can take, uh, you know, and pass to other people. Back at the back table is our director of works, Doug Stone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Our director of exhibits, Linda Daviar. I'm going to ask if you could uh, begin bringing maybe an archive piece now and then again. Well, I wish I would have known for tonight because I have the sample gold medal that was given out at the last presentation, Mr. Boyd. Oh. Uh, I didn't bring it tonight because I didn't know we were still doing that. So I will. <laughs> my apologies. Well, I, I'm doing this on a surprise, so you know, no apologies necessary. I thought we'd start the year off doing that. Uh, our secretary, David Meyer, uh, I found out more recently that on the second Wednesday of the month, which just happens to be, he's at a 5.30 meeting at work uh, as he works at City Hall. So uh, I'm gonna try to avoid those meetings. Uh, Vice President Mary Ellen, uh, I don't know if you're online or not. Uh, uh, let's see here, I don't see your name. So uh, we record these meetings. How many people have known or watched any of our recorded meetings on YouTube? Outstanding. Um, you know, some of them uh, still show some uh, not real good editing and stuff. I also have a report from our librarian, though. I want to let you know that he continues his steady recovery from his brain surgery last year. So that's good to hear. However, he's indicated to me that we should begin to look for a replacement librarian. If you're interested in volunteering and managing the Society's Library, which is uh, basically about two suitcases worth of books and memory books, a lot, some vintage books from the fair uh, that you can read on your own, but then you have to chase people down to check books out now and then. Uh, please contact any board member and let us know if you're interested in doing that. Okay, uh, my notes say to check and make sure that we are recording. And I see stop recording, so we must be recording. Uh, I'd like to set the stage for this presentation. I'll make one technical improvement. 
Yes. Would you pick the video settings at the bottom? Uh, video settings, okay. Pick the bottom, yeah. Pick mirror. Mirror my image on uh -huh. backwards? Yeah. Okay. Now you're forward. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm backwards up here, but uh, um, I've discovered that about Zoom. Mirroring your image works good when you're only looking at yourself, but uh, for everybody else, you're probably backwards, I guess, and I wasn't sure about that. So I'd like to state, set the stage for this presentation by traveling back to Sunday, January 10th, 1904, 120 years ago today. The fair would be opening in about four months and there was so much left to construct. For example, the dome on Festival Hall wasn't even started yet. The famous aviator, Alberto Santos Dumont, arrived in New York on his way to St. Louis. He was famous for flying a dirigible around the Eiffel Tower in Paris. I think he was a Brazilian. He wanted assurances that the fair officials were serious about the $100,000 prize that they said they would award for any airship that could complete a very specific but demanding flight. His visits and events would provide one of the strangest stories about the World's Fair. And uh, I'm not going to tell you much, much more than that, uh, but we'll sometime talk about aviation or you can go and look him up on the web. It was also reported that the famous professor Samuel Pierpoint Langley, anybody heard of him before? He's got an Air Force base named after him. <laughs> he was preparing to complete a fixed wing airship, bring it to St. Louis and compete in the competition. His prior attempts at flight had ended in failure, including a launch off a houseboat in the Potomac River. That one ended in a quick splashdown. <laughs> uh, he had earned a whole lot of ridicule in the press for that. And I think it was even filmed where it goes off the houseboat and splash. Uh, looked like the Wright Brothers fl uh, flyer. And the Wright Brothers had flown, you know, six months ago or four or five months ago in December 1903, but they weren't ready to come and try to do a, you know, two mile flight or something like that. So if they weren't ready, I suspect other people weren't either. The commissioner from Persia, which is now Iran, Dikran Khan Khaladan, said that his country would participate in the fair. He said that if his government, the Shah, would not pay about $20,000 for pavilion, then the citizens would pay for it. They did have a pavilion that was made, and it was inside the courtyard of one of the uh, palaces. But... Uh, Dikran Khaladan was greatly upset when the Persian pavilions at previous expositions were used as theaters where dancing girls performed. <laughs> so with that, uh, our look back at history and uh, a chuckle or two, uh, it's time for our presentation. After the presentation, be sure and stay for the attendance prize drawings and a preview of upcoming meetings. Michael Loind, our presenter, is chairman of the St. Louis Olympic Committee, and I'm going to turn this so they can see you before I oh, switch okay. it to PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, we'll switch to PowerPoint in just a minute. Uh, uh, he is the chairman of the St. Louis Olympic Committee and chairman of the St. Louis Sports Commission. He's also a member of the International Society of Olympic Historians and a St. Louis sports attorney and lecturer. I told you about his 2022 book about the Watermen, and that really got him in the 1904 Olympics. Mm -hmm. But you and your organization had a lot to do with the renaming and rebranding of Francis Field. That's right. And uh, Francis Olympic Stadium, mm -hmm. which right. didn't have the word Olympics in them beforehand. And also uh, a little thing that I'm going to show you, well, I guess, well, it's on your first slide. We'll get to, <laughs> get to that. Um, and I need to change the... PowerPoint to, or the share to PowerPoint. Okay, Doug, you should see the working PowerPoint. I'm gonna go full screen for Michael. It takes a second or two sometimes to uh, energize, come on. There it goes. Huh. 
get up there and go away. Okay. Uh, I, Doug, I think you cannot see the what's on the screen here with the little thumbnails, and I don't know of any way of uh, minimizing those thumbnails. Maybe doing that. Oh, that's better. No, there you go. Perfect. Okay, so there's uh, something else uh, Michael's uh, organization was highly responsible for is how many people, is there anybody here who has not seen the Olympic rings at Washu? Raise your hand <laughs> if you have not seen them. Oh. I you hope can you tell them where to go. And yeah, I hope you get to it. It's right by the, uh, which is now the Francis Olympic Stadium. It's on Olympic Way. And just turn down and you'll see them. There. It's a great sculpture. They call it Olympic Spectacular. Um, most of the modern cities that have had Olympics have these because the rings weren't invented until 1912, I think. 1913, we didn't get them. So we had to work with the Olympic Committee to retroactively uh, award us these rings. So that was a big deal. So we were the first ones to get them retroactively. Um, and I think we put those in about four years ago, maybe four or five years, right before COVID. So uh, we, were, we were very proud of that. And um, as, as a St. Louis Olympic City, we're part of the World Union of Olympic Cities. And I'm also a member of that. And we meet once a year um, around the globe, depending. Usually it's this year was in Paris because the Olympics, Summer Olympics uh, this year will be in Paris. Um, and then every other year it's in Lausanne where the Olympics have their headquarters. So just kind of a little FYI. Um, it's great to be back. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. So either you couldn't find a good enough speaker or uh, I was actually halfway decent. So I, I have some uh, new information to share. We have some fun slides to share. Um, we're really going to cover uh, mostly not what happened. We're going to cover a little bit about what happened at, at the 1904 uh, World's Fair Olympics, but we're mostly going to cover how they happen, why they happen, what was the lead up to that? Because you got to understand, this was the third Olympiad, and the only the two before was Athens and Paris, so it was very young, and the Olympics were just starting, and people didn't understand what they were, and America really had no idea what they were. So this was the introduction of the Olympics to the United States. There are six cities that have hosted the Olympics. Does that can anybody name a couple? Lake yeah, Placid. Lake Placid, excellent. Do you know the do you know the last one? Squaw Valley. Squaw Valley, excellent, fantastic. Six, and then of course we were the first. Uh, 1904, we were America's first Olympics. Uh, we hosted the third Olympiad, like I said. But the original hope was that those Olympics go to London, so we were not supposed to get them. Um, why did they end up in America, and how did St. Louis get them and ultimately help save the Olympic movement? And the other thing I want to answer is, who the heck is Charles Daniels? And we're going to cover all that uh, as we go about. So let me see if I, let me just want to make sure I'm hitting the slides right. Let's see. Mike, is this how I change them? Let's see. Did that change? The oh, wait. Okay. Great. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So the, the tale of the 1904 Olympics is really a tale of two adversaries. Uh, one being Jim Sullivan who's the guy with, well, both of them have mustaches, but, he, <laughs> but, but he's, he's the individual who uh, was the head of the Amateur Athletic Union in the United States, which was very powerful at the time. Uh, Pierre de Coubertin, who's the other individual, he was uh, what they call the French founder of the modern day Olympics. And these two men were born six weeks apart and could not be more different. Uh, Sullivan, was, they were both patriots, this is true. Sullivan for the United for America, Coubertin for France. They both loved the Olympic and Olympics and wanted them to succeed, but they wanted to them to succeed without the other involved. And in short, they they hated each other. They absolutely hated each other. So, but the Olympics evolved because of these two. Let's see. So Jim Sullivan, just just to give a little color on him, he was he was tall, he was blunt. He never mints words. He grew up in the Irish slums of New York. He was born to Irish immigrants a year into the Civil War. Uh, he despised Europe's aristocracy, uh, believed people should be judged on merit alone and not their bloodline. The sports culture in America was just beginning after the, after the Civil War. Prior to that, Puritanism kind of ruled the day. 
uh, which means you worked and you prayed and you didn't do much else. Uh, but after the Civil War, the industrialization and, and new inventions started to free up leisure time for people. And a, a new wave of immigrants who were coming to the United States didn't want to spend their Sundays, uh, their entire Sundays in prayer and rest. They wanted to have fun. So sports started to grow in popularity. And some of those sports uh, were professional baseball. College football was very big. A uh, variety of amateur athletics run by the elite athletic clubs. Uh, the one individual pictured here with the Boston, who are the, called the Boston Bean Eaters at the time, uh, that is Albert Spalding, who we know as Spalding Sporting Goods. So he was a little background on him. He was one of the first person to popularize uh, mitt, using a mitt in baseball. Uh, okay, so sports, again, so sports culture, again, was was getting very big, very popular. In fact, even Mark Twain observed that it it, sports became the symbol of the raging, tearing, booming 19th century. And Sullivan saw sports as his way out of the slums. And he got a job at a local magazine and started one of the first sports sections. In contrast, Pierre de Coubertin was a short, highbrow French gentleman who went out of his way not to offend people. He was born to wealthy aristocrats. They had several beautiful states around France. What is pictured here is, is their main house, uh, which, is, which is now... Um, uh, a museum. Uh, he was the third son, which meant, as far as French inheritance law, he didn't really inherit much of the land or any of the titles. So he was kind of given a small trust that, and they just expected him to go into law or politics or science or the military. But something happened to Coubertin when he was seven years old. In 1870, uh, Germany marched into Paris and Napoleon III surrendered the fertile lands of Alsace-Lorraine to the Germans. It was a humiliation for France, and Coubertin never forgot it. The French had grown soft since Napoleon Bonaparte, and Coubertin wanted to return the French to, to their first-rate power, especially with the constant threat of the superior German army now on their border, who everybody knew it was just a matter of time before Germany marched back into France and started a, started a war. So Coubertin wanted to make France strong again. They needed to defend themselves. And he took a page from the British Empire, who at the time covered a fourth of the world. They were the greatest empire the world has seen at that time. The British Empire also was the father of modern sports. And they were the ones who defeated Napoleon at Waterloo. It was said that their soldiers' great military prowess began on their school sporting fields. So Coubertin, wanted to, to adopt this for France to his family's horror. Sports, again, for the French thought sports was just frivolous. They thought it was Anglo-Saxon and uh, Anglo-Saxon and well, like not French. So they, they hated the idea of sports and anything. But Coubertin was persistent about it. And he really thought sports was the way that France could regain their strength and, and strong military and their prowess on, on the European field. So in 1890, Coubertin gets an invitation from a guy by the name of Dr. William Penny Brooks, who's from England. Uh, he was from a small town called Much Winlock, and he wrote to Coubertin, who, who he knew was, was very interested in English sporting culture, and invited him to come to their Olympic festival they had in their local village, and it had been going on for about 50 years. So Coubertin went, and what he saw was the first nuggets of what would become the Olympics at this at this thing. And he was getting nowhere in France trying trying to get the sporting culture going again. Nobody liked it. Nobody approved of it. But he thought these Olympics, because William Pennebrooks was telling him about times that they tried to make them international and it just failed. And he thought that would be a good idea. He thought, if I can't get France strong through sports, maybe we can get peace through Germany by getting an understanding on the playing field. So that was his whole idea behind the Olympics and he was very excited about it. So Coubertin shared his vision now with uh, Professor Sloan of Princeton, a friend of his who was a French professor there. And Sloan said, well, look, why don't you come pitch your idea in America? So this is the, so Sullivan, so he comes to New York and meets Jim Sullivan for the first time. And he pitches it to a lot of the athletic leaders here in the United States. And they hate the idea. They, they don't understand international competition. If you think about it at the time, to travel 
overseas takes two weeks at a minimum. It's very expensive. A amateur athletes at the time were not reimbursed in any way. There was no uh, real organizations to support them. And there's no radio, there's no international press. So there's no real way to cover these. And so again, Sullivan went right up to Cooper Den's face and said, I think it'll be an inevitable failure. So it didn't, didn't exactly create the warm and fuzzies between the two. So Cooper Dan licks his wounds and he said, okay, well, I'm going to go to London and, and pitch it to them. Well, London was even worse. <laughs> the father of modern sports had no intention of letting some Frenchie telling them how sports should be conducted. So Charles Herbert, who is the head of the British, British Amateur Athletic Union, said, look, your Olympics are neither viable nor useful. And if any athlete wants to compete against the best athletes in the world, all they need to do is come to the London Championships and that's, that's where they'll find the best athletes. So Kuberdan makes a third pass. So he's, America's kicked him out. London has no interest. So he, he sends out all these invitations and tries to get all these international group leaders and academics, sports, past and future Nobel Prize winners. He invites them to the Sorbonne, has a big lecture on why the Olympics should be viable and a wonderful thing in the international community. Crickets. Some Snickers. Nobody's interested. Nobody gets it. So finally, Cooper Tan goes to the Greeks. And he said, look, <laughs> this is patriotism. This is Greek, Greece at its best. You guys have to put these games on. It's, it's all about, you know, pride of country. So he convinces a couple, Prince Constantine of Greece and a wealthy Greek named George Azeroth to bankroll the games and refurbish the ancient Greek stadium in Athens which they do, not without some difficulty, but the games do make it to fruition. And in 1896, they hold the first Olympics at the Panathenaic Stadium in Athens, which they redo all the marble and everything. It's beautiful. But you could see by the track, I mean, this is a very ancient stadium. It's not exactly conducive for running or anything like that. That is a very savage hairpin turn. And that's only a 200 meter track. So the Greek don't Greeks really don't know much about modern sports, but they're but they're excited to celebrate Greece and its its past history. And but the one thing is Athens is hard to reach. It's it takes if you're coming from the United States, it takes took three weeks to get there. You had to take boats, you had to take trains, you had to take boats again, and then you had to take another train to get there. And Europe wasn't much better. Uh, so most of the people really it wasn't publicized all that well. Most of the athletes, again, kind of dismissed it. So the only people who really showed were people who self-selected themselves on their own dime. Uh, so the world's top athletes didn't come, or only around 70 athletes from 13 foreign nations came. The rest of the 241 Olympians were Greek. It was an all-male event, and they had 43 events. Of those events, 12 of them were track and field. And here they held the first marathon ever at these games, 25 miles, and it resurrected the old Greek marathon run where uh, if you know that, that story, the legend is that uh, they needed to send a, a message to the king and, and the guy ran from marathon to the king for 25 miles and then dropped dead when he delivered the message, which I think is they had won a war or something like that. Um, so anyway, and the other thing was swimming. So, <laughs> and swimming was a little dicey. So they they just did it in the Greek sea, which is freezing. They basically rowed these guys out, dropped them in and said, swim back to shore. And the winner of, the, of those events said, look, it became more about surviving than it did even about winning. <laughs> the waves were high and the water was cold. So that was kind of the, the, the Greek events. Now the, the medals they gave, it was silver if you won, and it was copper if you took second. There was no third place. And the other thing they gave, they gave a, a, an olive branch from, from Athens, and they gave a, the winner a diploma. So that was the big thing. Plus, the winner got to meet the king. He got to shake hands with the king. So that was a big deal back at the time. Uh, but again, not many Americans came. There was 13, and they were all, Professor Salone kind of selected them. They were out of Princeton and Boston. There were people who could afford to go that long. Um, the Olympics were in April. They were over Easter. And they, you had to have the means. You had to be able to leave class. And that's what they did. 
But surprisingly, uh, of those 13 athletes who came, we won nine of the 12 track events, which was unheard of. So this got Sullivan's attention, Jim Sullivan, who wasn't interested in the Olympics, but he said, hey, you know, if we can get the Brits to come, this could get interesting. So Sullivan called his friend, Albert Spaulding, who we saw earlier. And Albert was now a big, a big magnet with sporting industry goods. And he said, look, if we can raise money, they're going to hold these next Olympics in Paris. And we could get some, some of our best athletes to go. And hopefully the British will come and we'll, we'll have it out once and for all and really show them up, show that America is the best. Spaulding was in. He was a patriot. He's like, right, that sounds great. Let's do it. So it started to set the stage for what would transpire over the next eight years. So the Paris Olympics, Coubertin was extremely excited about the Paris Olympics. This was in his hometown. This was France. They were going to have the 1900 World's Fair. Everybody was coming. Coubertin thought this was going to be the coming out party of his Olympics. Now, at the time, the World's Fair Committee was looking for something to rival the 1889 World's Fair Eiffel Tower. And Coubertin had a great suggestion. He said, look, there hasn't been a stadium in the world since the Coliseum. Let's build the greatest stadium the world has ever seen. Let's resurrect stadiums again. Let's, let's make it an ode to sports and we'll just bring out the Olympics. Well, the, the, again, the committee of the World's Fair had no interest in sports and they opted instead to paint the Eiffel Tower yellow. They thought that would be a better symbol than, than a giant stadium. So, <laughs> so the Americans get their team together. They have 53 track and field athletes. And Britain's attitude remains, if anybody wants to compete with the best, they can, come to, they can come to London and compete with the best. We're not going there. But some of their athletes on their own dime did go over. And, and we got to compete against some of them. They were mostly in swimming. There was a few, a few of the Brits in track and field. Uh, but the Paris Olympics overall proved to be a disaster. They never even used the word Olympiad, mainly because the World's Fair Committee was not interested in sports and didn't want to give Coubertin anything like that. So the athletics, it was kind of funny. The, the, the sports was kind of couched in with all these other weird things that the French just didn't really have a concept of sport. So, so sport was considered cannon firing, pigeon shooting, firefighting, delivery truck driving, kite racing, and all these Olympic events were scattered in, in there as well. So nobody even knew they were really an Olympic event. There was no stadium. Again, they they opted to paint the Eiffel Tower yellow instead of building a stadium. So the track events were run on an uneven grass field outside of Paris with trees. There were no seats for spectators. No, well, nobody really showed anyway, so it didn't really matter. Um, the discus and hammer throwers had to throw through these fields where there was a giant oak tree right in the middle of it. So you had to kind of throw around it. Uh, and again, Coubertin at the end said, Nothing could be more difficult than trying to persuade a number of French spectators to attend a sports meeting. And he was right. Nobody came. The only people actually at the track and field who were spectators were the American teammates who were rooting their, their friends on. So, and then swimming, let's see, did that go? Swimming they did in the River Seine. Now, this is this actually had a pretty good showing. All, a lot of the top British swimmers came. Now, unfortunately, there's only one American he wasn't even part of the group that came over. He just happened to be in Paris. Americans did not swim at the time. I think we had only 12 swimming pools in the entire country, only 500 swimmers. Just it, we were not interested in it. So the Brits dominated the sport. They 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 cleaned up. And the one thing that was kind of wait, did that? Uh oh, what did I do here? You want to continue? I think yes, right? No. All right, no? no. Oh, should I sex it out? Okay. Now, see, I'm trying to go to the next slide here. Oh, if I don't. Ah, there we go. Okay, perfect. Thank you about that. So the the Paris, and just to show how kind of disorganized they were with their sporting events. So the the trophies were anything from ribbons to silver and bronze medals, first and second. Again, 
There were silver cups. There were silver bowls. One swimmer got a 50 pound, pound bronze statue of a horse. I don't know why, but that was given out. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> so just very, very interesting. Again, not, not well organized. So it was, it was, again, everybody considered it a huge joke. The athletes thought it was a joke. Uh, nobody was all that satisfied with it. And Cooper 10 even confided in friends and said uh, it, it was it resembled nothing. There was nothing Olympic about these games. And he said it would be a miracle if they survived. So Sullivan decides to save the Olympic Games, and he wants to save them from their founder, Pierre de Coubertin. So Sullivan tries to do a coup to seize the games. He wants to bring, to bring them to Buffalo for their 1901 World's Fair. And Sullivan, again, is a very boisterous person, and he already, he already starts talking in the newspaper. We're bringing the games to the 1901 World's Fair without even talking to Coubertin or anybody. He just thinks he can will it. So, <laughs> so he what happens is Coubertin kind of fends off his coup in a very clever way by getting one of the top American sporting men to join the Olympic Committee, which was a good maneuver around Sullivan. Sullivan was pretty upset by it all. Um, but also Coubertin went to England and said, look, will you please host these games because Sullivan is still trying to pull them to America. And again, England said, look, we thought we think your Olympics would be a frost, pure and simple. There's there's nothing enticing about them. And again, the Beth athletes, they can always come to the London Championships. That's that's how they viewed it. So there was nobody else interested in the game. So Sullivan knew that the next games would go to the United States because we were the only ones who wanted to host them. But Sullivan was still trying to pull them to the 1901 Pan American Games. And and Coubertin wanted them every four years. He did not want them every year. The other thing Sullivan was trying to do, he was trying to eliminate everything but track and field. He thought track and field was the only thing viable in the Olympics and all the other sports he could care less about. So Coubertin was fighting him on this. So what Coubertin does is he reaches out to a friend in Chicago, who's the head of the University of Chicago, and says, look, are you guys interested in these games at all? He said, yes. He said, okay. So Coubertin in the press says the next games will go to the, 1904 to Chicago. So that's how Chicago gets the games. So Sullivan is really upset. Um, so you see joy in Olympic Games. So University of Chicago held a big bonfire when they got it. Everybody came to celebrate. They were going to host the 1904 Olympics. But again, America still didn't quite know what the Olympics were. So Sullivan gets his nose out of joint. And somebody else is going to weigh in. A guy by the name of David Rollin Francis, who we've all heard of. So the St. Louis World's Fair, as most of you know, was originally supposed to be in 1903. But because of delays in construction, like some of the other World's Fairs, it was pushed to 1904. Once it was pushed to 1904, David Francis said, I want those Olympic Games. He's like, there's no way there's going to be an international competition that summer that we're hosting the 1904 World's Fair. All the trains were already set to come to St. Louis. St. Louis had all the money. St. Louis had all the momentum. And... He went to Chicago and basically squeezed them out. He said, what he did is he went to Jim Sullivan. And he said, look, you promised us that you would hold your AAU championships at our World's Fair. Well, now it's 1904. So I want you to commit and say all the athletes will be in St. Louis and none of them will go to Chicago. And that's what happened. And once that happened, Chicago knew they couldn't put on successful Olympic Games. And they, award, they conceded and they went to St. Louis. So St. Louis was already building a stadium to host the sporting events here. And St. Louis was the first World's Fair to actually make an exhibit of sports. It was a separate exhibition with a, a person selected for that. So Coubertin was beside himself. He didn't. He, he was happy that they were going to be in 1904, but was not happy there were going to be another World's Fair after what happened in Paris, after they just kind of crushed it and buried the Olympics. So he, he was not happy about these games coming in. What made it even worse, <laughs> David Francis hired Sullivan to run the games, which so now the Olympics are on life support and Pierre de Coubertin sees his mortal enemy put in charge of these games and he's left to see if they survive or not. So everything's hinged on on these St. Louis games. OK, so that's that's the stage. 
Let's see. So the Olympic Games, Sullivan announces they're going to be from August 29th to September 3rd. And what he means by this is the track and field games. Again, he's only concerned about track and field. He creates Olympic medals for track and field. But the other games, he said, look, I don't care if you have them or not. So he went to their individual governing bodies and he said, look, if you want to have an Olympic event here, you put it on. I'm not going to bother with it. But my Olympic Games are August 29th to September 3rd. And that's at, at the stadium. So several St. Louisans step up. Dwight Davis takes over tennis, who we all know from the Davis Cup. Albert Lambert, whose family are famous for Listerine, who also, Albert Lambert was kind of an interesting guy in Lambert Airport, as we know. He was one of the first flyers. Uh, Wilbur and Orville Wright taught him to fly. He was very interested in that. And he started, he was so fascinated, he started setting up mail routes with these airplanes, and which is ultimately how he gets to meet Charles Lindbergh and why Charles Lindbergh went to Albert Lambert and said, hey, I have this idea about flying overseas. Would you fund me? So Lambert gathered up all his friends at the St. Louis Racquet Club downtown, and they passed the hat, which is why it was called the Spirit of St. Louis. So just kind of another aside there. Um, and the other person is Alex Meffert, who the MAC just opened up their club, their first clubhouse in 1903. Alex Meffert was hired from New York. He was actually one of Charles Daniels' first swim coaches to be the swim coach at the MAC, which was a very formidable swim team at the time. And he said, look, I'm going to I'm going to make sure we have an Olympic swimming contest. And so that's so these three individuals were and there were others involved, but these three were the main ones involved in making sure that other events happened at the time. So the American public was introduced to the Olympics for the first time. It was it was well covered in the newspapers uh, for the first time. You know, the Paris and Athens games weren't well covered. They got full page ads. Everybody was getting curious and very excited about these Olympic games. They would built the first Olympic gymnasium was built, which uh, the facade is still there at Wash U. Again, the first Olympic modern day stadium was built at Wash U. They had the first lines were drawn on the playing field so the audience could follow when people threw a hammer throw or something like that, how far it was going. They had the first Olympic announcer at these games. Uh, and you could see some of the lines and some of the stuff there. They actually labeled some of the events. You could see the signs that was never done before. So a lot of firsts. And our Olympics was the one to debut Olympic diving, boxing, the freestyle wrestling, the decathlon, and basketball held its first Olympic exhibition here. Uh, so very, very exciting stuff. This was, we are the birthplace of the gold medal. So for the first time, the gold medal was introduced. We gave gold, silver, bronze. And, and obviously that set the stage for the rest of Olympic history. But that all started here in St. Louis, which is exciting. The first medal there, I want to point out in the middle, that was that was the official Olympic medal. That was given out to all the track and field athletes. The other one, then again, the individual uh, governing body committees made their own Olympic gold medals. That's why you see sometimes different gold medals from the 1904 games. This one is golf. Basketball had a different one as well. And the other one, if you didn't create your own medals, Sullivan just gave you the amateur athletic uh, medals to give out. So that's what the swimmers got. Uh, so anyway, just kind of just kind of interesting. So St. Louis, again, we're far away from Europe. So we have to attract an international audience and international competitors, obviously. So Coubertin and the Brits have no interest in coming. Coubertin does nothing to get the French to come. But we have a couple of aces in the hole. St. Louis is a melting pot of immigrants. That helped us a lot. The other thing is the Bush family. They were from Germany. They had very good relationships with Germany. They And they encouraged all these German athletes to come. And then they housed them at the Bush mansion, um, which was which was interesting. And, and other athletes from Canada and Cuba and everything like that came. So it was actually the greatest, most foreign athletes on American soil ever assembled which is very exciting. 121 among the 651 Olympians uh, were, were from foreign countries. That was twice as many as was in Athens. So very exciting. Um, some of the athletes who came, George Pogue, 
who was the first African-American to win an Olympic medal. He won two. He won two bronze. He was actually born in Hannibal to uh, parents who were former slaves. And he ran for uh, Wisconsin Athletic Club, the Milwaukee Athletic Club. Uh, George Iser, who won six medals at this. He was living in St. Louis at the time. He was a gymnast. He was a world-class gymnast, but he had a wooden leg. Um, so he was the first uh, athlete with a disability to compete and medal in these games. And it wasn't just a fluke. George Iser then went over to compete in Germany on uh, an American team that won the international competition. So he was he was a legit athlete and an incredible athlete at that. Uh, other two athletes, Ray Uri, who went on to Olympic fame, he was undefeated in his Olympic events. It was the standing high jump, standing long jump, which they discontinued after three Olympics. He won all the gold medals in all those three. And the French in Paris called him the human frog. So he was, he was an amazing athlete. Matilda Howe, she was actually, the, for the longest time, considered the first American woman gold medalist. She won it in archery here in St. Louis. And the only reason why she's not fully considered that was because sometime in the 1950s or 60s, the Olympic Committee decided to go back to the Paris Games and kind of make them more legit. So one of the events they had there was uh, women's golf. And the person who won uh, was a woman who received a bowl for winning, but she never really knew that she competed in the Olympic Games. Her mom and her just happened to be over there and decided to compete. So she died in 1955 and never even knew she was an Olympic athlete because it wasn't done until retrospect. So if you go, if you look on the all the medal charts, it lists her as a gold medalist, but she didn't at the time. And Matilda Howell was the only one during her lifetime who was the first American gold medalist. So interesting. And then we have the marathon. Now, this is obviously a lot of stories with the marathon is always, always interesting. Uh, a lot of them not true some true. So we're going to dispel a little bit of that. The The marathon occurred on August 30th, which was, it was just under 25 miles. There were 32 starters. It was 90 plus degree weather. So the heat was real. There was only two water stops, one at the six mile mark, which is a well, and the other at a 12 mile mark. Uh, Jim Sullivan, and again, they were still experimenting with the various medical stuff with sports athletes. So they were doing this thing called minimizing fluid intake because they wanted to test the limits and effects of purposeful dehydration on these athletes, which was, again, common area of research at the time, but at, now in retrospect seems ridiculous and cruel. So there were there were also cars. For the first time, there were cars uh, who followed these these athletes. And the problem was the roads were just dust. So all these cars were kicking up dust into these, these runners who were breathing it all in. One breathed in so much dust, he had to be taken to the hospital. Uh, so all that's true. Uh, one, and, and the first, again, just to give you a little color of some of the, the people who ran, uh, one, one was Frank Pierce, who was a first Native American Olympian, which was great. He set the stage for Jim Thorpe eight years later. There were several South American participants who were working at the fair, who decided to compete, were great runners, by the way. Uh, Felix Carbajal, who was a Cuban mailman who raised money to come, who was a great runner. He came to New Orleans first, that was his first stop, and then lost all his money in a dice game. So he had to hitchhike his way to St. Louis. That is all true. And at one point during the marathon, he plucked some apples from a tree and they were kind of bad apples and he got sick to his stomach. So he had to had to stop at the side of the road until he felt better and could run, but he still had a good finish and he probably would have run the race had he not experienced all of that. Uh, Tom Hicks was probably one of the most famous runners. He was the one who hitched a ride. Uh, he was actually a, a, a great athlete. He was a great runner, but he was having stomach cramps because they weren't getting water. So at mile nine, he hitched a ride with one of the judges in one of the judges cars. So it wasn't hidden, it wasn't secretive. And the judge's car, they they drove, and and the guy who was in first place, Fred Lawrence, sees his car going by, and he's just exhausted. He's like, "What the heck?" Sees this runner waving at him. Well, that car, you know, had trouble, and had it, I don't know if it broke down or what, but it did have to pull over. And and by that time, Hicks was like, "I feel pretty good. I'm gonna finish running." So he goes running into the stadium, and the crowd erupts, "Hey, the winner!" Now the tale is, he ran, he he broke the finish line. They were going to award him, and Alice Roosevelt was there. She was going to put a wreath around him, and they were going to give him the medal. 
none of that's true. Alice Roosevelt was not there that day. Uh, he ran in, they did cheer, but he immediately, I don't even know if he crossed the finish line. I think he kind of just like, I just wanted to finish the race. He told the judges immediately that he got a ride. Um, so anything else you hear or read is not true. Uh, anyway, so Fred Lortz, so he's dying on, on, he's running, he's barely standing up. Uh, he's dehydrated severely. He is there. And then they decide his trainers decide to give him strychnine at one point, <laughs> which was the first, first illegal doping in Olympic history, but it wasn't illegal then. So I guess that's okay. They gave, they gave him a taste of whiskey and they wouldn't give him any water. He did finally come into the stadium. He did get cheers. He crossed the finish line and collapsed and was, was taken to the hospital. But he, he was the winner. <laughs> and I don't think he ever, I don't know if he ever ran a marathon after that. But Tom Hicks, who was the one who got a ride, he did win the Boston Marathon the following year. So again, they were good athletes. It was just very difficult conditions. So now that brings us to swimming. So swimming was held at Life Saving Lake, which was kind of an ironic name. It was next to the Palace of Agriculture and all the animals would defecate in, in the lake itself. So far from being life-saving, it was, it was a lake you did not want to swim in, to be honest, uh, but they did. And that's, that's where the events were held. They did it off a wooden dock and you could see there was a huge crowd. So swimming events in the past in the United States, again, it wasn't a popular sport. They would only draw about a hundred people at most to even their championships. And they were mostly friends and family, but something happened right before these Olympics. There was what was called the General Slocum. And it was a steamer that would carry passengers in New York to some of the islands around the area to take them to Rockaway Beach. And it caught on fire during a, a church picnic outing where there was women and children, mostly and none of them knew how to swim. Over a thousand people died that day. All they had to do was jump in the water and dog paddle, you know, just dog paddle for about a minute or two. And there were boats trailing that could have picked them up, but nobody could do it. They jumped in and would just sink to the bottom. So a thousand people died. Over a thousand people died that day, and it got America, uh, awoke America up and said, we probably should learn to swim. So this was the first big venue, the 1904 swimming, that people could actually go and see from all over the country. So there was reports of 10 to 20,000 people at this event, which is just massive. I don't even think there was that many in the stadium. Um, so it was, it was a very large event. And... It was the most well attended from the foreign athletes. So the Brits didn't come, but the Germans did, the Hungarians did, um, and they were a formidable swimming force. So the events were going to be three days. First day, we got clobbered. The Europeans just swept us. We didn't, we didn't win anything, and we were embarrassed in front of our home crowd. The second day, similar thing happened. We were just getting pummeled. And then there was one guy named Charles Daniels. Now, Charles Daniels at the time was 19 years old. His father was the Bernie Madoff of the day. His father had walked out in his family when he was 14 years old. His father was a flanderer. He, he had a Wall Street firm. He didn't give them any money, didn't give Charles and his mother a penny to support themselves. He ran a Wall Street swindling ring and was busted in 1903, and it made all the papers. He had swindled millions of dollars from people all over the country. It was huge news, and they were thrown out of society. To give you an example, Charles Daniels' grandfather was a New York Supreme Court justice, was a congressman. They were very well-to-do. They were in a very wealthy family in Buffalo, and they were thrown out of society. So swimming, this obscure little sport, was the only way he saw to regain his family name. So he was determined to be the best at it. And the last... One of the last events of the second day of swimming, Charles Daniel steps in. He goes up against the German champion, and he goes up against the Hungarian, and he goes up against the Australian. And he jumps in. It's a 200-yard 200, 200 race, and he finishes. And not only does he beat all of them, but he breaks the British world's record, which had not been done in 75 years. So the Brits immediately go, no, 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 it didn't happen. That was fake, bad you didn't have the right timekeepers and everything like that. So they denied him a record, but it set the stage for what was to come. So this is a picture of Charles Daniels in his prime. He's a pretty good looking guy. Um, and it set the stage for the 1908 London Olympics. So now 
Sullivan has successfully introduced the Olympics. The Americans are excited about the Olympics. They're rabid about the Olympics. And the Brits, because Sullivan started talking in the papers, he was trying to call them out. He said, look, they didn't come, but they would, we would have beat them anyway. So now the Brits are interested. And they're like, we want to host the 1908 London Olympics. We're going to build the biggest stadium the world's ever seen. We are going to show the world that we're still the top sporting event, sporting country in the world. Cooper Tan is ecstatic. The Brits are finally acknowledging the Olympics. And Sullivan is determined to make a show of it. So, again, and if you want to, since that takes us out of the 1904 Olympics, we're into 1908. If you want to find out what happens, there's a great book called The Watermen that, <laughs> that tells you all about those 1908 games, what happens with Jim Sullivan, what happens with Pierre de Coubertin, what happens with the Americans, what happens with the Brits. But I will give you one little taste. Charles Daniels was getting so good at turns and he kept beating the Brits several different times and breaking the records and they kept denying him. They kept finding excuses to deny his records. So the Brits built a hundred meter long pool that had never been done before. So he couldn't turn. And then at the last, the gold medal round, the Brits used to go on your market set go. They did not use a shotgun start. They told everyone except Daniels, we're going to go on your mark, go. And Daniels was still taking off his robe when they made the call and everybody hit the water. So again, if you want to find out what happened, great book called The Waterman. It tells you all about it. But thank you so much for your time. And uh, it's it's been a lot of fun being here. And I hope everybody enjoyed uh, the presentation. But if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Any questions? Yes, in the back. Oh, wow. I should know can, that. Can but... you repeat the question so people can hear? Yeah. I, could everybody hear me during that talk? I, yeah. I usually, my wife says I speak way louder than I need to, but <laughs> it's just in our house. So it's just a common trait. We didn't have to talk. Uh, okay. Uh, the question was when did the equestrian events uh, start in the Olympics? Uh, I don't know the exact answer to that. I don't believe they were here in St. Louis. I don't think a question was here in St. Louis, but I, I'd have to go look and, and see. I'm 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 not up to speed on that. I would uh, think it was. I, I would guess in the 20s after the World War One. Yeah, the only I, they Same could they there. could have been possibly at the London Games, but I don't think they were even there either. Um, yeah, I, I think you're right, Mike. I think it was probably that's just a, yeah after bit. 1912. So. That's too bad because there was a leftover 50-pound horse. <laughs> right. Yeah. They had to give that horse to somebody, right? <laughs> That's why the swimmers got it. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I know several of the marathon runner. Oh, so the question was uh, the story of the person's shoe, the track runner's shoes getting stolen during the 1904 Olympics. Um, I know at the marathon, a couple of the runners did not have shoes. Uh, they were the South African runners. Uh, so they just ran in bare feet. And um, he took his shoes off, I think, at some point. Uh, he had he had like he had like leather shoes. They weren't good for running. And I and think they ran in his street pants and they cut those off. Yeah, right. And they cut those off too. That's exactly right. So but I, I don't know. I I think like I've seen pictures. I think Carball actually starts with shoes on, but he did they did say he took them off at some point. So I, I don't I don't know about the stealing of the shoes. I don't know about that. Yes. Was there any shoes to uh somebody else asked the question? Was the Olympics involved at Lake Sherwin opening the new Pony Time way back in like a couple of nineteen and things like that? He was asked the question sometimes so Lake Sherwin in Oakland? Overland. Um so the Olympic rowing was at Creepcore Lake. Um, that and obviously golf was Glen Echo. Uh, those were the only two events that were outside the fair that that I'm aware of. Uh, there were some swimming championships that were here in 1905 um, that were in North St. Louis uh, at a lake there, but that's that's all I'm I'm aware of. I, I don't think there was anything other than you know the mar and the marathon route. If, if everybody's familiar with that, that ran through Creepcore and Clayton and. Right. Yeah. 
it, it, it might have been the 1905 swimming championships, which was a big deal after the 1904 Olympics. Charles Daniels, all the big stars came to that one. And that was St. Louis. So that might have been it. That that might be what they're asking. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Tell me this is a true story. I've heard that the Glenapple Country Club is the only country club in the world that illegally flies the Olympic flag and he says it. Okay, so he asked if the Glen Echo Country Club is the only country club in a world that can legally fly the Olympic flag. There has only been a few Olympic golf competitions. After, after 1904, it stopped. And then it didn't start till Brazil, the Brazil games. Uh, so here's a little, here's a little tidbit. Uh, Glen Echo does fly the Olympic flag proudly, as they should, but they do it illegally. Um, <laughs> The uh, IOC has to approve all that stuff, and and they have not gotten their approval yet. We're trying to help them with it, to be honest. So I think it's just a matter of time. But a lot of the stuff they have there, which they proudly display, and they should, they do so illegally. <laughs> but we we won't tell the IOC that anytime soon. Yes, Jana. Uh, so the Victorians did some crackpot things with their medical beliefs. <laughs> why, why strychnine and why did anyone think that would help? You know, it's a stimulant. That's that's all I can think of. It's a stimulant. In, in small doses, it, it, it's a stimulant. It is. It's, yeah, it's small doses, it's, it's a stimulant. Good. Yeah. Oh, she asked why in the world of, she goes, the Victorians were pretty crazy with some of their medical beliefs. Why in the world would they give strychnine to somebody? You know, which is she correctly says typically rat poisoning, but in small doses it's a stimulant, and and that's that's why they that's why they did it. Yeah, they also gave a little whiskey too, during during that the marathon race. Follow up question: Wasn't the guy with the strychnine carried over the finish line? Did he... So the guy with the strychnine, he he was not carried over the finish line. Now now the 1908 marathon winner was carried over the finish line um he was but he was if you see a picture there's two two guys standing next to him on the road to the stadium and they're not holding his hand but they're pretty close and that was just the picture i'm guessing he probably got a little help somewhere you know to keep him from not collapsing but uh, it's he crossed the finish line and then collapsed is what i'm told and i don't think he was helped across yes Uh, he played, yeah. So, so he he asked about uh, Lambert Field, uh, which was which was named after Lambert because he owned the field, and that's where he did his flying. But he said, did Colonel Lambert win a silver medal at the golf contest here in St. Louis? Colonel Lambert played golf in Paris Olympics. He played golf here at the 1904 Olympics. He did not win a medal at either of those. Yeah. Yes. That I'm aware of. I, I don't. I don't believe he did. The gymnasium was uh, built. He said during the World Fair. Yes. He didn't, he didn't mention anything about gymnasium sports. Yeah. So the he asked the gymnasium was built during the 1904 World's Fair, but we didn't talk about the gymnasium sports. Um, so you would imagine that gymnastics would have probably been in the gymnasium, but it was not. It was actually held on Francis Field outside. Um, they had a display of gymnastics, uh, the pummel horse and all that stuff in the gymnasium for a while. Albert Spaulding made sure to use it to sell his wares. Um, basketball was played in the gymnasium. Uh, again, it was not an officially recognized Olympic sport. It was an exhibition sport, which they have to be before they become an Olympic sport. That is the only one that I'm aware was in the Olympics. Uh, but most of the gymnastics events were outside on Francis Field. So there, there, there could have been maybe one or two events, but most of them were on Francis Field. I have a question that I've asked you before and you declined to answer, but I'm like, <laughs> I, I will answer it this time. 
Okay, I'm holding you to that yeah. because I know the answer is in the book. Yeah. Uh, there's articles in here and there about the Olympics, some of them exaggerated, about the swimmers and water polo people that were in the water for an extended period of time who got sick after the Olympics uh, from being, quote, near the livestock exhibits. Well, Life Saving Lake was about a half mile away from where the livestock exhibits were at the far end of the Palace of Agriculture, yeah. you know, going up Skinker. So in my opinion, there's no way any refuse or whatever from the livestock would have gotten into that lake. But I think it is likely that in early 1905, when a typhus influenza spread around the world, that a lot of people did get sick. I, yeah, I, so yeah, the, so the, the question was, in a nutshell, the, the life-saving lake, which it was near the Palace of Agriculture, now Mike said it was a half mile away, you said? Approach. About a half mile away. Um, that was it, was it in fact infected by feces and all that, that kind of stuff. So there are several reports that I read. Now, again, it's suggested that the Palace of Agriculture was was the culprit because they had a lot of livestock and stuff like that. Another culprit they said was a lot of the 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 human exhibitions that were going on, Filipinos and whatnot. Well, they had cattle and 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 they had pigs and all kinds of stuff there too. And it was said that they brought them down to Life Saving Lake to to drink and bathe and stuff like that. Now, if you look at where that exhibit was, that's a pretty far. I think it's a pretty far stretch to go all the way down there. Mm -hmm. um, could the animals have roamed down there? Yeah, probably. Now, several swimmers, three of the water polo players died um, after the 1904 Olympics. And it was speculated that they got typhus from being in, in that lake. It doesn't add up because the gestation period for typhus, if they would have got it in that lake, they would have gotten sick a lot quicker than they did. Mm -hmm. um, they competed around August, September. The first one didn't die till late December. And then there was one in January and stuff like that. And just station period is typically 30 days um, where you'd have symptoms and they didn't report any symptoms. So it's doubtful that that was, that contributed. And some of the reports even lumped other people that weren't even at those Olympics that, oh, they got typhus at, in the, in the life-saving lake. So that wasn't true either. Um, in fact, one of them they even said who, who got it had died before the Olympics. So that was that was kind of funny. Yeah. Um, there was a question over. Any other questions? I thought there was one more yeah. over here. No. That was a stretch, good. I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm going to ask Michael Loin to come around the front. Oh. He'll draw. Start drawing some names. Yes. Come on going to try something a little different with the camera here. If you'll maybe stand right about here, we'll put the box in between us. And as I said earlier, when you come up, maybe stand over between Mike and the wall there so that we can get a picture of everyone. And let's see, is this uh, aimed about right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I want to turn the lights on. Yeah, so you can turn the overhead. Yeah, put the, oh. got it. We have, have a item donated by Carol Parolo back there, I think. Uh, the Devil in the White City. Ooh. How many people have read that? How many people have heard about it but haven't read it? Okay. Uh, this is a story of 1893 Chicago. And it's kind of like two separate stories that almost could have been independent books about America's first mass murderer in Chicago. And there's a chapter about that. And then there's a chapter about organizing the Chicago World's Fair. And then another chapter about the mass murder and what he did. And now they're building the World's Fair and then the mass murder chapter, you know. And it's kind of like these two stories, almost separate back and forth. But both stories are very interesting once you realize the structure of the book. Uh, the mass murderer was eventually caught. I won't tell you what happened. And the Chicago World's Fair did get built. And I won't tell you... Uh, you know, how it uh, succeeded and ended up and stuff like that. But it's a very interesting uh, historical narrative that tells a good story. Yes, Jana. It's chilling. Chilling. Okay. Well, there, there's a review of it. So that's been donated. 
Um, we'll call seven names, uh, the book, three sets of cards, three diaries, and three uh, drawstring bags. So let's open this up and start drawing names. Yes. It gives you a nice uh, condensed idea of what it took to put together the character. Okay. Uh, the comment was the book has a very good narrative about uh, what it took to make the Ferris wheel because the Ferris wheel was first built for the Chicago 1893 fair. And I also found it very interesting of the person, the challenge they had of organizing all these egotistical architects who were all designing all these different buildings and palaces to get it together and then starting to build it on frozen ground that they had to really dig into to make the foundations of those big palaces and stuff like that and how they managed to pretty much pull it all off, a lot like uh, St. Louis. Not everything was done in time. And it got delayed a year. It was supposed to be 1892 to yeah. commemorate 1492. Right? Mm -hmm. But, uh, okay, hey, that was the uh, era. You know, they tackled big projects and they got them done really pretty fast when you consider how th how things went. But go ahead and start drawing oh, the names. Okay, Mike. so draw a name? Mm -hmm. you got <laughs> all right. Here we go. I, uh, of course, I don't have my glasses on right now. Uh, <laughs> Justin Z. That's not my name. <laughs> Can I get to pick which one? You pick uh, whatever you want. Uh, 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 Running. Okay. You'll like it. You'll like the book. Oh. Yeah. Justin King. Hey. hey. Oh, Justin. There we go. Go ahead. <laughs> See a theme here, right? <laughs> Craig, uh, Craig Schmidt. Schmidt. Oh, there you go. Hey. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, another journal. All right. Carol Parolo. All right. <laughs> you get your book back, right? <laughs> ah, donate a book and uh, win, a, win another prize. All right. Sharon Roberts. Oh, Carol oh, Sanford. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Okay, Kathy Whip. Oh, oh. Ah, yeah. <laughs> nice, Kathy. I didn't get the big guy. <laughs> <laughs> Rosalie Stevie. Did I say that right? Stoby. Going down. Okay. How are we doing? Any more? Um, yeah, this might be the last one. Okay. Nancy Hanky. <laughs> you sure you put it in here? <laughs> so is this what makes you? No, she did. Sit <laughs> so down her bag. <laughs> and Mark, I put the names up here. Would you take a picture of those so we know the one? And then let's get everyone to squeeze in together. I'm going to play Jesse and you go join him oh, in the middle okay. or over yeah. my shoulders or yeah. pay attention to the here. photographer here. Yeah. Bunch up. Yeah, group hug. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. I'm not kidding. Squeeze in a little more. Squeeze in a little more. Short people in front, maybe. Yeah, like ladies in front. That would do it, guys. You don't have to squat, you know? Yeah. You're yeah. tall enough. <laughs> Get in front, Kathy. Come on, on the you, side. You get side. Yeah, Kathy, oh, there's tall guys over here. Okay. I'll see you. I can't even see your face, Kathy. <laughs> okay, we'll wait. <laughs> Have her move over one, and then I'll stand. Me? Yeah. Okay. How's that? There now. You can see the gentleman behind me. Little fat face. I mean, you're. <laughs> 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 okay, one more. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Mike. You did a, uh, yeah. okay. a great job doing that.
And I think uh, seven or eight people uh, are going home with something they didn't expect to. So. <laughs> not me. <laughs> Art, are you taking money? I want to sign. Art, are you taking money? I, I will, but don't wait. Doug, have you got me on screen? Sure. Okay, good. Um, there's a because there's a couple things I'm uh, got to do, uh, and we've got oh, a good 20 odd minutes, so I've got time to do that. Um, let's see. Uh, tennis prize drawings, all good. Uh, quick update about upcoming meetings and events. Uh, I guess we can close that and get that out of the way mm -hmm. of the in-person people. On Monday, February 12th at 6.30 here at Booter Library and on Zoom, we'll view the PBS documentary, Playing for the World, another athletic Olympic year uh, thing to do. Uh, it's the story of the Fort Shaw Indian Boarding School girls basketball team. The co-author of the book about that, Full Court Quest, Linda Peavy, will be joining us on Zoom, and we'll have a few words to say. She lives in, uh, I think, Philadelphia, or back east somewhere. On Thursday, March 14th at 6.30, we'll have a meeting to learn all about the Wanamaker organ. We'll watch a couple of videos, and the president of the Friends of the Wanamaker organ in Philadelphia will be joining us for that Zoom meeting. Uh, it's not going to be a presentation. We'll be watching some of the videos uh, and you'll get to see inside the organ and how it was put together and about, uh, you know, St. Louis, et cetera. And how many people know what happens in April? Uh, in April, we'll have two very special events. The exact dates are still being determined, but here's what I know as of now. On April 15th or 16th, the History Museum will provide a very special, by not by invitation, but a, for a group visit for the World's Fair Society members to go to the museum and be one of the first to see the new exhibit. I'm thinking that it will likely be an after work meeting uh, on a Monday, Tuesday, maybe Wednesday night, April 15, 16, 17. Uh, the public opening is currently set for about 10 days later on April 27th. Uh, and if you can imagine, you're going to see a lot of press coming out. The press will get previews and they'll take pictures and they'll talk about it, you know, at the news stations and stuff. Uh, I don't know that I even want to try to come that first weekend of the Saturday, Sunday at being open. I think the line will go out to Lindell and down the street for a ways because they're going to have to do crowd control. You can only fit a couple hundred people in there at a time, I think. Thank you. Oh, I don't think it'll go quite that far down to Francis Field, but uh, we'll see. Uh, there will be light refreshments and then a visit and tour of the new exhibit. And I'll show you a little sneak peek that uh, some of us got to see in just a minute. Uh, and that same week, we have another special presentation. How many people know who Patrick Murphy is? Okay, uh, a longtime producer, broadcaster on PBS. He's written two or three books already. Uh, he has published, and it's being printed in the next month or so, Prelude to a Century, the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair. Uh, yours truly got to uh, help provide some inputs and, uh, let's say, complete a high school education and get him up to the college level. So it's... Uh, at least as of when I last saw it, fact-checked. <laughs> uh, but he has earned six Emmys for his public television documentation on the history and culture of the American heartland. He's already authored three books about St. Louis and Missouri. So I'm really, really looking forward to that. It's going to be a coffee table book, almost the size of, you know, the big Red World's Fair ones. Uh, have probably 200 plus pages with three or four pictures on each page and captions on each of them pretty much. So looking forward to that. Okay, uh, I want to see one last call if anyone has any other questions or information about the World's Fair Society events or happenings, because I'm going to switch this screen and show you pictures for about five or 10 minutes. Yes, Mark. And if you repeat the question. <laughs> What kind of effect is it going to have to have a particular work for society? 
question was with the opening of the new, new exhibit and all of that, uh, what kind of impact can we expect? A lot of interest. I hope that we will be contacted. I hope that we don't get inundated with inquiries. Membership applications we can handle because we can print more bulletins and send them out. Um, and hopefully re reignite and rekindle and hopefully get more people uh, who are working of working age to join the society because our demographics are kind of uh, skewed towards the larger numbers. Thrilled to have Carter and Justin and Holly and all these young people join us. We sure are. <laughs> For sure. So now, speaking of, uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. <clears throat> Oh, I went to PowerPoint. For a <laughs> sure. So those of you that are here and you're renewing your dues and so forth, my wife will have a pen and paper. She'll jot down the name and I can take it on square or I can take the uh, checks or whatever it is that you would like. But I need to get the name, the information. We'd ideally like to see your Validate your email, your phone number, your address, that we got all that correct, yeah, along with uh, information. But we are in technological age of Square, and we do PayPal too, so we can do electronic uh, payments for your uh, for your convenience. And we've adjusted things accordingly. So if you have any questions or anything, please see that lady. She'll refer you then to me, and then we'll take the information on, on the phone if you like. Thank you for your second. And to follow up with the question, you're gonna see some pictures, it's exciting. It's gonna be invigorating. The Missouri History Museum, this whole thing. Yes, without a doubt, we're gonna have an increased interest in membership. So tell people about the society, we want the information and validation, so yes. Very positive. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. And you can stay up here and help answer questions or tell about any of the pictures. Uh, Doug, could you maybe dim the front lights again so that they uh, show up a little bit better? Uh, this is our fa the Facebook page that I posted pictures of about six hours or so ago. This is uh, Mr. Jody Sowell. Uh, he is the president and CEO of the History Museum, and he welcomed us to a, uh, like I said, a... Uh, sneak peek of the construction efforts and how it's going today. Um, let me find the, uh, go to the right button over here, there. And there's the one man that I recognize as probably being even more enthusiastic about the World's Fair and this exhibit than I am. And you all know that I'm pretty dedicated and interested. Really exciting and he's, uh, he gets your blood, blood, blood going. He's, Good man. And he's had a lot to do with putting this together. So there's the uh, few of us, Phil Taxman also uh, finishing up a grape or something like that. On the far left is Karen Gehring, uh, one of the operations people of the World's Fair and her husband. I'm not sure who the guy on the right is. But uh, we had a light snack last night and those of us who braved the uh, uh, weather and took a chance that it wouldn't get too bad and it wasn't, uh, got to see this. Yeah. Did I hear the wow? Ooh, yeah. ah. it is even multiply that by a hundred when you're there. You get really, it's incredible. Of course, some of the buildings aren't quite turned around. There's some technical issues. Mike's going to coordinate. Yeah, we're not going to harp on those, but uh, it's really impressive. And I will say this up front. There were five or six of us here early. The gray area is going to get projected upon by an overhead projector so that the grass is green. The water areas will be blue and rippling a little bit, and the pathways will be kind of a uh, light orange, like in the lower left of the on the map where the green is green and the pathways were, you know, kind of a light orange. But I'm going to keep this zoomed in at least a little bit so you can begin to see, you know, the main palaces. Palace of Transportation is missing up here. There's Festival Hall, and I'll zoom in a little bit more. We'll see that a little bit more. Okay, I'm going to zoom out because I'm going to go to the next picture. There's about... I'm sorry, I didn't. 
Transportation okay. is there. There's a PALS missing that's going to get yeah. there. We're moving on. Oh, I'm sorry. You're correct. Transportation is there. Machinery is missing right across the way. Okay. Oh, okay. yes. No, it doesn't work. Here, I was. But you can't see it on the screen. Never mind. The good oh. catch, Garrett. We were testing. This, this area right here is where PALS and machinery is going to go. Garrett, you missed that one. Percentage is what stage of completion would you say it is? Uh, it's going to be open April 27th, and I bet they'll be working up right until then. It's half, halfway, I would possibly, uh, if I was guessing, 50% right now. We're uh, ripping pause. Well, if you look behind him, you can see that the wall decor is there, the cases for the exhibits are there, uh, and in early April, they'll start filling those up and doing the trim work on this, I think. The structure's there. It's going to move. Quickly, I imagine, but yeah, it's that it start starts. I believe the art uh, central pavilion is how to find art is backwards. Yeah. Uh, I'll take a note of that and I'll check with an expert. Uh, we have uh, already provided some feedback to him. Uh, I think I've seen a view like this, and I think both sides have the columns. I'm not 100% sure of that. Yeah, 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 six across the front, and you have nature and. Um, oh, the statues on the top probably weren't yeah, on the back. Exactly. Oh. Uh -huh. Okay, I'll uh, check that on some other pictures and Man, let them know. Only in the 1904 World's Fair Society do we have <laughs> members that can really pinpoint this. They, they need to have us go over there and help them. Yeah, they, sh awesome. they should have had us over there three months ago. I agree. Mm -hmm. um, they have a floral clock that actually rotates a little bit fast. but uh, No, uh, that's what he said, but it's going to be projected, I think. Right, it is. It's, I saw the uh, there's a picture of uh, part of the pike. Just to kind of show you the level of detail they're getting to. Oh, that uh, empty spot there was a uh, place where uh, something to be fabricated will be placed eventually or soon. Is that all St. Louis? Um, I don't think so. I'm not 100% okay. sure. Okay, here's creation. Uh, looking down towards the main entry area over here, uh, I couldn't capture the whole pike in one shot. Just to show you the detail again, it's kind of neat to see the buildings. I think this is uh, Paris. Uh, and this is mysterious Asia right here. Uh, down here, so kind of sideways is Tyrolean Alps and the Irish exhibit right here around it. This would be under and over the sea right here. What's the answer? Uh, I'd have to kind of look at a map. I think, oh, this is Hagenbeck's right here. And I think that's probably an enclosure for some of the animals to walk around the edge of. Uh, I say enclosure because they had wide open enclosures with a lot of different animals in them, bears and tigers and uh, camels all in the same thing and keep them all well fed and they were happy. Oh, look at that. Now, one of our earlier guests noted that it looks a little heavy because I will agree that these connecting pieces between the inner ring and the axle were actually wires and ball, not wires, but bars that were probably Steve Schmidt and I guessed four to six inches. So when you see the pictures of the Ferris wheel, you see the steel between the inner and outer rings. And then on the inside, it's very light, feathery. Uh, it's probably hard for a 3D printer to, you know, try to get something that small that would support so something. But I suspect the cars are, you know, all pretty accurately sized. And I think you all know the 16 by 26, and it's probably from this wall to the column and probably maybe not as wide as between the two columns, but not far from it. You know, this area right up here from the columns, the size of one Ferris wheel car. And I tell that to people, even at the History Museum, and I paste it off at the History Museum. People go, why are you walking things off? Two and a half foot per step mm -hmm. type thing. 
to get a 16 by 26 or 27 foot. And when you go, this was the size of one car, they all go. Numbers are easy. Seeing a size is something else. There's the DeForest Wireless Telegraph Tower. Uh, looking. Yeah, they are. Uh, Garrett was one of the first to notice that these pylons uh, were put there for dedication day in 1903. And by the time 1904 came around, they were gone. But the flagpoles that were in between them were still there. But those don't appear to be flagpoles. But I wanted to capture this view kind of from uh, looking at the top of this over towards Festival Hall and education and uh, manufacturers right here. There's electricity right there, uh, et cetera. Uh, I think I posted one or two more pictures. There's a little bit better close up. And we have already pointed out to them that the decision was made in early 1904 to cover over the courtyard of education and social economy to put more exhibits in because it was a nice large courtyard and they needed more exhibit space. You can see the three cascades here flowing down. And again, you can kind of see the walkways are lit up a little bit differently uh, than the grassy areas that are a little darker. Uh, there's the Ferris wheel sideways edge on. Uh, Illinois is not there yet because I was looking for that one and there was, you know, kind of one of those holes. And you can also see the lagoons that are depressed going under the bridges, which are white. Uh, you know, and that will be blue water and the Grand Basin over here will be blue water. Okay, so there's a picture of Festival Hall, right? Okay. And where do you think that is? They're going to have a rotation. I think they said, uh, correct me wrong, Linda, are 120 pictures rotating about every 10 seconds? Over 100 pictures of the fair rotating to show what this looked like and how large because... This is going to be spectacular. Uh, one thing that they noted and recognized, and I pointed out to them two years ago, the old exhibit didn't give you a good sense of the size of the buildings. It only had small pictures of the buildings here and there. Well, this is going to do it in two ways. Number one, three ways. Number one, showing you the scale model. Number two, the pictures on the wall. And I didn't have a chance to take any of those. They are large pictures, probably 12 feet high and eight feet, nine feet wide color. Uh, you'll recognize them coming out of some of the souvenir books and stuff. But they're also going to be showing pictures on a rotating basis of the fair and the people at the fair and stuff like that. Mike, how are they color? Are they colorized? There are some pictures of the fair that have been colorized, and they are using those on the wall, you know, that show colorized images. And after I take a first lap through these, we'll see if we can get some wall pictures. Uh, they talked about the back room, which really has nothing but cases in it right now. Uh, and what's going to be displayed? Oh, in the upper left, you can see Festival Hall. And that's a picture of one of the colorized maps of the fair uh, that uh, I think they might have used that on one or two of the panels around the side. This is looking through the doorway at the scale model in the big room. And this is where they're going to have exhibits uh, associated in two different themes. And I've only got five minutes left. Two different themes in the first two years will be foreign countries and what they showed at the fair and what they brought to the fair. And they have a map of the world with number 12 showing what came from Brazil and where the Brazil exhibit was and some big words to talk about it. And they'll put some Brazilian display things on, on exhibit. The other thing that they're going to put in will be some of the souvenirs that were bought at the fair. There'll be a case with a lot of Ruby Flash in it because everybody loves and has Ruby Flash. Uh, there'll be some China pieces. I asked them if there's going to be the common China pieces that, you know, people in here have, we've got given away some of them as attendance prizes, banquet and stuff like that, that, you know, are of reasonable small value. And then there's some that are, you know, 
well, that's worth about three or four hundred dollars type thing. And they'll probably have some of that on display too, because they have vast collection of souvenirs. Uh, and I think he said they are not asking for any contributions from members with large collections at this point because they have so much and they will put those on display for two years. Uh, then there'll be two other things and they're already planning a lot of Olympic stuff for 2028 when the Los Angeles Olympics will be held in the United States. Yeah. Exactly. So they're going to have it. They're, they're planning that far ahead, two, four years down the road for this back room. Uh, you may want to contact them and see what they're into. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see here. Where's that arrow? Um, they also allowed some of us, and I didn't find out about this till I was almost going to leave. So Linda and Art got to walk all the way around the balcony. Um, besides the three of us, has anybody else ever been up on the balcony in the exhibit from before 2002? Illegally. Ah. <laughs> there used to be an elevator that would bring you up to the balcony and you could walk around and they had some silhouettes and some wall hangings and stuff. They had to raise the railing about six inches, but it still was not something that OSHA agreed that they could let visitors wander about without someone kind of supervising, you know, dropping things on people and stuff like that. Uh, you can see the cases on the side. You can see there's only so much room between the edge of this exhibit, which is only a little bit larger than a Ferris wheel car. That scale model is maybe a foot or two larger than a Ferris wheel car. And there's an, ex uh, I think a picture of an intramural car in the background and you know, if I zoom way in, you'll see what we saw in the uh, previous pictures, kind of, kind of uh, looking down map view. And I think there's only one more picture here. Come on. Yeah, this one, L looking down at the scale model, it really looks like a map there, doesn't it? So down below at the very bottom, you see those little square things? Those are the interactive. So you'll have interactive uh, where you can identify. It's also got a spot where you're standing to orient to while you're on the on the fair. All this is like, you know, it's 50% there. It's, it's still got, I mean, this is the beginning. There's a little red dot that shows basically where this part of the History Museum is at. And they get the north-south orientation for us people, how we're used to seeing <laughs> things versus how they dig the maps. And you can see some little portions of the map. Uh, this is basically Oakland over here. Interstate 64 goes right through the, uh, the inside, inside. inside in and then curves off to the south as you get towards the middle of the fair here at uh, Skinker, which goes right up and down the middle of the fair. Uh, it, it's just really neat and it's going to give people a totally different impression of the size of the fair between i think i've started down this road before seeing the scale model seeing the pictures that are large and then seeing the giant pictures on the screen when you see the pictures of and i always like to point this out when i give a presentation of let's say the cascades and the people walking up art hill towards festival hall it's kind of like almost being on top of the arch and walk, looking at people walking around the, the arch. <laughs> the, uh, the art museum is right behind Festival Hall here. Let me go back about six or eight. My clicks. kids would say it's here. <laughs> oh, I want to go back. Okay. It gives you a sense of height, the third dimension as well. We're all used to seeing maps, and we just don't get the height. Oh, there's Festival Hall, and there's the art museum. So that this was a special unplanned treat as of two hours ago. Uh, the inside in I talked about. Uh, this is all the state things, the bird cage. Where's the golf course building? You know the golf course now. Uh, there I don't know if they have a projection set up for that. But uh, we're just about time that uh, they're going to be closing. Come on. Oh. Okay. There's a good backside of Festival Hall. I think I got. Um, 
get around to where I'm looking at Festival Hall from the front. And that will be my last picture. Uh, there's Festival Hall from the Festival Hall is kind of right in the middle of all the uh, scale models. So it's kind of hard to get up close to it to, you know, see it up close. But there's Festival Hall, the Three Cascades, the Grand Basin, et cetera. So there's your sneak preview. These pictures are all on Facebook. Okay. Yes, Carol. Last question. Real fast. Are they going to have uh, corresponding numbers when they flash the picture on the screen to the building? I think that will be part of the interactive thing. You can push a button and maybe it will illuminate a little bit better or in a different color or something. That is what our understanding is. And then in the, in the dream world, if they 